Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, we really thank God for our senior pastors. Amen. Please uh, continue to pray for them and uh, support the Nutcracker Show. Uh, this weekend, we're going to get on with our message. You know, last weekend, uh, Deputy Senior Pastor Daniel Kong preached on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is one topic that I feel very passionate about. And I want to take this opportunity to reiterate some very important points when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit from last weekend's sermon. You know, because we must really let these truths sink deep into our spirit so that it transforms our lives. You know, so sometimes it's not just hearing the message once and then we forget about it, but we must really reflect and start to apply it into our lives. You know, so firstly, you know what he said was that spiritual gifts are gifts of grace. You know, God gives spiritual gift to every single one of us, every believer. You know, these gifts do not prove that we are more spiritual or we are better than other people. And there's nothing that you can do to earn the gifts. So when we exercise the gift, let's be humble. You know, let's know this, that God wants to give the spiritual gifts to each and every one of us. You know, so turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to give you spiritual gifts. So that's the first thing that we learn from that sermon that, you know, spiritual gifts are gifts of grace. The second thing we learn are spiritual gifts are also tools for the task that God has given us. You know, these are not toys. These spiritual gifts are not toys for us to fool around, you know, so don't fool around with them in the cell group or in church. But as we use the spiritual gift, know that it has a purpose, that the Lord wants us to use this gift to finish the work that He has for us. So it's very important that Every single believer and Christian must know that there is a tool that is available for us. We must use that tool. It is not an indicator of rank or performance or seniority in church. Uh, But in fact, you know, in in the book of 1 Corinthians, you read that, you know, this church is a church that is uh, uh, full of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but Paul mentioned to them, Paul addressed many issues about this church. There was an issue of division, of confusion, and even immorality within the church. But yet God used these problematic Corinthians who are Christians powerfully in the gifts because they are tools for service. And this is precisely the reason, okay, that these gifts are not earned nor rewarded. They are given freely, you know, so that we can do the work of the kingdom of God. And therefore, all of us must use these gifts to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. You know, so all of us need spiritual gift. Amen? So that's the second thing. The third point of last weekend's sermon tells us that spiritual gifts are not only gifts of grace, not only tools for the task, they are also disciplines to be developed. This means that we have to use them, we have to practice, we have to grow in them. This also means that at the beginning, when you start to use them, you may not be familiar, you may, you may have concern, you may not be comfortable or good in them. But if we were to develop them diligently, you will get better and better. So it doesn't matter when you start, whether you are successful, you are not successful, or whether you see the effect that you thought you're supposed to see, we must learn to use more and more of the spiritual gift because the more you do it, the more you use it, you will learn and you will grow. So don't be discouraged if you stumble, uh, develop the gifts with discipline, you will get better and better. You know, tell your neighbor, use your gift, fan it into flame. The reason why I want to mention this again is because I feel that spiritual gifts are supposed to be a key feature of the church today because it proves the power and the reality of the Holy Spirit. But yet in church, there, this is often, you know, the issue about spiritual gift is that it is a very neglected, sometimes misunderstood topic among Christians. You know, we don't talk about it enough or we hold on to some erroneous teaching about spiritual gifts. Consider what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Paul said this, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, Paul reminded the Corinthians that they are not supposed to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. And the same reminder is echoing in the church today. We cannot be ignorant about spiritual gifts. But yet, there exists confusion, misunderstanding about spiritual gifts in church. We hear statements like this, and I'm sure some of us would have heard this before. We should pursue love, which is the fruit of the Spirit, 
instead of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have, have heard this statement before? We should, we should pursue love, which is the, the fruit of the Spirit. We should not pursue the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Or you hear people saying that we should seek the giver and not the gifts. Have you heard this statement before? I'm sure some of us will have heard this, you know, in our Christian journey. As much as this statement sounds true, I want to tell you that the Bible does teach us that it is okay to seek spiritual gifts. So let's not be ignorant, let's not be misinformed, let's not be uninformed. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. It says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So make no mistake about it, the Bible doesn't tell us you cannot ask for spiritual gifts. It does emphasize that we must pursue love, but at the same time, pursue, desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So there is nothing wrong to seek spiritual gifts provided it's done correctly. The Bible teaches us here to earnestly desire them, specifically the gift of prophecy. So asking for spiritual gifts should be a regular item on our daily prayer. But how many of us honestly have ever asked God for spiritual gifts? This is the reason why in the church today, we do not see much of the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Even though this verse in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 clearly shows us that God wants us to pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So do not just seek the gifts and do not just seek love. Seek both love and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It means that when we use the spiritual gift, we learn to grow in love. We learn to love God more. We learn to love the people whom we minister to. Today, I hope that all of us are set free to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Amen? So I pray that at the end of this season where we preach about the Holy Spirit, where we preach about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we enter into a season where we see more and more of the presence, the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons that church all of us needs to be good at moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is because we need the demonstration of the power of God to show the world that our God is real so that non-believers can come to know Jesus Christ. This is why today I want to talk about the ministry of healing. Specifically, the gift of healing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to heal the sick, to show that God is real. That's why the title of my sermon this weekend is The God Who Heals. God shows us that His nature is to heal. He is powerful and we need to reach the lost with the demonstration of the power of healing. Let's look at Luke chapter 9 verse 1 to 2. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 to 2 says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank You for Your presence here with us this morning. Lord, we thank You, Holy Spirit, that You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, You heal in the past Lord, you heal in the days of the early church and Lord, you still heal today. Lord, release an anointing of healing among us. Release an anointing of faith among us to believe you. And Lord, we pray that God, anything that stops us from experiencing the power of God be removed. And Lord, today we'll see a breakthrough. And if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray that this day will be a day of that person's salvation. And Holy Spirit, we give you all the freedom to do what you want. Lead us. And Lord, we surrender to you. We ask that you come and fill this auditorium and even at Suntec City right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. This verse that we just read in Luke chapter 9 tells us that healing the sick is part of of the message of the kingdom of God. Jesus sent His disciples specifically to preach and not just to preach a message, but the message comes with healing the sick. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 even tells us specifically it is the Holy Spirit who anointed Jesus Christ to heal the sick. 
Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how He went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with Him. Now, the secret to Jesus' ministry was God was with Him by the Spirit. And therefore, the power of God was there, was present to perform miracles. I want to tell you, all of us today, that if you are a Christian, the same Holy Spirit that was with Jesus now dwells in every single one of us. And therefore, He can empower all of us for supernatural ministry so that we can do the same work that Jesus had done. In fact, this is the reason, this is the whole purpose why the Holy Spirit is upon every single believer. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us very clearly, the purpose is to testify. Acts 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we see that the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming upon us is empowerment. And empowerment for what? It's not just to let us know that we are safe, but it's to empower us to be witnesses. So whenever we see the, the, the power of God manifesting, it is the Holy Spirit who is working. And this is why we must all learn to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Because the more we walk with Him, the more we understand how He works, the more we will see the power of God in our lives. And today, I believe that God wants us to learn about about the ministry of healing because He wants to release upon us an anointing to heal so that we can demonstrate to the world, we can demonstrate the power of God, the reality of God to those people who have not yet trusted Jesus. Now, when I was a young Christian, when I, when I just got saved, before that I was a, a, a someone, someone who is anti-Christianity, I was... I immediately became very interested in the reality of God. I was very interested in miracles, in signs and wonders, in healing. You know, in my previous church, I always asked, hey, you know, there are very clear verses in the Bible that tells us that miracles are supposed to be the norm, but how come I don't see them in church? You know, I remember those days, uh, nobody could help me answer the question. They just say, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, they, they just avoided the question completely. I, I want to tell you the verse that bothered me a lot when I was a young Christian was found in John chapter 14, verse 12. It says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than this because I'm going to the Father. I tell you, when I read this verse, I say, hey, I believe in Jesus. And this verse is telling me that I will do the same things that Jesus had been doing in the past and I will do even greater things. You know, this is for every believer. It is supposed to be normal for Christians to be agents of miracles. That's sound, kind of sound, sound weird, you know. It's normal for Christians to perform miracles. Miracles are never normal. But I want to tell you this morning that every Christian must believe that we can do the very thing that Jesus Christ has done when He was on earth and even see some even more amazing thing because this is what the Bible tells us. So this is the reason why all of us must believe in the ministry of healing so that the sick and those who are suffering can be set free because it is a witness to the non-believers that the power of God is real. Today, I want to share with you two biblical principles concerning the ministry of healing and their implications for us. Okay, two biblical principles concerning the ministry of healing and what it means for us. Number one, God's will is that we be healed. And the implication of this is that if God wants to heal all of us, if God's will is that we be healed, then when we ask for healing, we must ask with confidence. This is the first principle when it comes to the ministry of healing, that we must understand that we are not fighting God's will. We are not trying to convince God to heal us. God already wants to heal us. I'm going to prove to you. And because of that, we can ask with confidence. It is important that we believe without a shadow of doubt that not only does God heal, but He wants to heal. Because most people have no problem believing that God can do the impossible. The question is, will God do it? Can God do it? Does God want to do it? This is in spite of the fact, I want to tell you that in spite of the fact that we may not see every time healing take place, we must still believe that it is God's will that we can be healed. You see, a verse in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, the second half tells us this, in putting everything under Him, 
God left nothing that is not subject to Him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to Him. Now this verse tells us that it is a fact that when Jesus died on the cross and He rose from the dead, that everything has been won. He has won the victory. Christians believe that. Christians know that. But currently, we do not see that happen yet, right? But we have no problem believing that, hey, everything is, is won already. It is settled. Everything is under the feet of Jesus. This is because there is still a cosmic war between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness going on. And this will continue until we really see the reality of this verse. Everything is subject to Jesus. And so similarly, when it comes to healing, while it is a fact that God's will is that all of us be healed, a battle is still going on. That in some cases, we don't see everyone healed instantaneously. There will still be sicknesses, there will still be death until Jesus comes. But we must still continue to believe that Jesus' desire is to heal the sick. This is important because if we are confident that everything is under the feet of Jesus, even when we do not see it, then we must be equally confident that when we ask for healing, we are confident it's going to take place even if we do not see everyone healed. Let's look through the Bible to examine the evidence that's going to show us that God wants to heal the sick and God wants to pour out His power upon us as ministers of healing. We'll begin with the Old Testament. Old Testament evidence to show us that God's will is that we be healed. Firstly, let's look at the name of God itself. We have the name of God in the Old Testament where healing is the very name of God. This is what the, what the Lord promised us, promised His people in Exodus 15 verse 26. It says, He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. The promise of God to heal here is based on His very name. One of the names of God is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord says, I am Jehovah Rapha, God who is your healer. I am the Lord who heals you. This promise is based on the very unchangeable nature of who God is. He is Jehovah Rapha. Now, many Christians have no problem believing that God will supply you all your needs, right? Because we know that another name of God is Jehovah Jireh, God who is our provider. So Christians have no problem when it comes to praying for their needs, we are very confident, oh God, you're going to provide me. I'm not going to go starving. I will have enough. No, the Lord, you will bless me. Because we know that His name is Jehovah Jireh, God who is our provider. But strangely, when it comes to believing God for healing, our faith level is not the same. Somehow when we pray for the sick, we do not have the same confidence as we have when it comes to God who is our provider. Today, I want to tell you that we need to bring our faith in God's name where He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us to the same level and even higher to believe that healing is the nature of God. This is the reason why we must know and understand that God's will, because His name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us, it is His will to heal the sick. This is the first evidence in the Old Testament. The second evidence is this. In the Mosaic Covenant, we see that not only does the name of God ensures healing, in His covenant with His people, the covenant always included healing. It is part of the whole package. Exodus 23 verse 25 tells us, Worship the Lord your God and His blessing will be on your food and water. We have no problem with that. We always believe wholeheartedly the Lord will bless our food, the Lord will bless what we drink. But let's look at the second part. It says, I will take away sickness from among you. How come we don't hold on to the second part as strongly as the food and water? Why is it that when we pray for provision, oh, I'm very confident now. The Lord will give you a job. Don't worry. The Lord will give you a job. The Lord will bless you. But when it comes to healing, many Christians somehow feel, I, I don't have it. I, I don't have the anointing. You know, we look for a, a pastor. We look for something else. But I want to tell you today, in the covenant that God made with His people, it is a package. It is everything. Healing is part of it. 
Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 15 says, The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but He will inflict on them all who hate you. So understand this, that when it comes to healing in the Old Testament, not only is the name of God, not only is the nature of God that He wants to heal, in the covenant He makes with His people, healing is included as much as blessing on, on all our needs are also included. Now, the third evidence in the Old Testament is the very compassion of God. That God heals us. Healing flows from the compassion of God. That this is a part of Him. That He loves, He has pity, He has mercy, He has compassion on the sick and the needy. In fact, Psalm 103 verse 2 and 3 says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Now, when it comes to verses like this, Christians have no problem that when you confess your sins, God's going to forgive you, right? You never doubt, or it's very hard to doubt. You sometimes don't feel it, but you know that it's true. That God forgives us of our sins. That is one of the benefits. But the Lord says here in Psalm 103, forget not all His benefits. All means everything other than the forgiveness of sin. He heals all our diseases. So why is it that we are shaken whenever it comes to the gift of healing? Today, Wanu, I want us to rise up in our faith and believe that, hey, if I can believe God for forgiveness of sin confidently, then when I pray for healing, when I ask for healing, I will also ask with the same confidence. It is clear that just as God forgives all our sins, he will heal all our diseases. If we believe with confidence in His forgiveness, we must believe with confidence in His healing as well. So the first evidence is that the name of God itself, the nature of God is that He heals us. The second evidence is the Mosaic Covenant. It is part of the whole package. The third reason, the third evidence is the compassion of God that He, he wants to heal. The fourth evidence in the Old Testament is the work of the Messiah in the new covenant, in a prophecy. Not only is the healing of our body part of the Mosaic covenant, healing is part of the blessings of the new covenant when the Old Testament was prophesying about the new covenant. The scripture teaches us that healing is part of the work of the Messiah. The Messiah did not just come to forgive sins, to break the power of sin. The Messiah came for our healing as well. Healing for the body is included in the finished work of Jesus Christ because of His death and the resurrection. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 53 because Isaiah 53 is one of the greatest messianic prophecies in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Before Jesus came, before the Messiah came, it was already prophesied what He was going to do because it provides an understanding, a foundation about Christ's substitutionary death. The death that He died on the cross, what is the purpose? Isaiah 53 verse 4 to 5 tells us this, Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. Now when we look at a verse like this, most Christians have no problem understanding that the cross brought about forgiveness of sin. But the second part of it, by His wounds, we are healed. It's not something we really emphasize, we really want to see it happen in our lives today. In fact, I want to tell you, the word infirmities is translated many times in the Old Testament as sicknesses. In fact, even the word sorrow can be translated as sickness. Old Testament scholars who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, who understood the Jewish language, the Jewish culture, the Jewish scripture better than all of us today, they translated the verse to read as he, he himself took our infirmities and carried our sicknesses. It's not carry our sorrows. So it is very clear to them in their understanding that the Messiah will come and carry both our sins and our sicknesses. In fact, the New Testament writer Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he chose to apply this verse in, um, in Isaiah 53 to point clearly the ministry, the healing ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. He quoted this verse to show us that 
part of the work of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is to heal the sick. And he made it very clear in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 to 17 says this, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. The whole healing ministry of Jesus Christ was based on the fact that He carried our sins and He carried our sicknesses and diseases on the cross. So please understand that the cross is not just about sin. It is also about sicknesses and diseases. The Apostle Peter confirmed this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. So we must all understand that the Messiah's work is not just to forgive sin, it is for our healing. So when we are confidently praying for people's sins to be forgiven, when you pray for the sick, we must have equal confidence, if not more. So one major inconsistency I observed among Christians is that we know that the cross brought forgiveness of sin. We know that the cross brought redemption from sin. We know that the cross brings healing from sicknesses and diseases. We have a lot of confidence, you know, when it comes to praying for people to receive forgiveness of sin. You know, when they call upon the name of the Lord, their sins are going to be forgiven. They will come to know Jesus Christ. And we, when we pray for them, for the power of sin to be broken in their life, for habits, you know, for, for, for struggles that they have, we have no problem believe, believing that this power of sin can be broken even though some of them may still be under the influence of sin or they may be still under the influence of curses or may still struggle against sin, but we never doubt, right? Most of us confidently pray, one, oh, I break the curses in Jesus' name. Oh, I, I, I declare that your sins are forgiven. We are very confident when we pray for all these things. But when it comes to sicknesses, I realize that many Christians, hey, we are not so certain. But today, I want to pray that all of us will continue to challenge this area of healing. We continue to believe with them. Because as much as we see sometimes people struggle with their sins, they still are in bondage, they, they struggle with certain curses in their life, you know, the fact is that we keep challenging them, right? If we minister to somebody who is struggling with gambling, we know that the power of sin is broken. But somehow that person is still gambling or still smoking. What do we do? We keep on telling the person, hey, Christ has paid the price for you, you know. Christ has done it for you. So we repeatedly go back to them confidently and say, hey, God, you know, brother or sister, believe God for your freedom. We are very confident of that. But when it comes to healing, when that person is not healed one time, your first prayer is somehow uh, you try to disappear for a long time. You don't dare to go back and tell the person, hey, look, you know, Jesus Christ died for your sickness. You know, you can be healed. Call upon the name of the Lord. Somehow we are inconsistent. I want to pray that today, even if not everyone is set free immediately from their sicknesses, it does not shake our belief that all can be set free. We must be confident because we must be secure in the knowledge that God really wants to heal the sick. Today, let's know that it is God's will that we be healed. Let us not compromise what the cross has done for us, even if we do not see every. Uh, sicknesses are instantly healed. We continue to struggle with the sicknesses. We continue to pray and believe that that sickness can be broken, that sickness can be healed. Just the same way we declare the power of the cross over every struggle of sin. This is why Christians, we should not pray like this. And let's not pray like this. Lord, if it's your will, heal this person. Do you pray, Lord, if it's your will, please stop this person from committing adultery? Do you pray like that? Why is it that we don't pray like that? Oh God, if it's your will, please stop this person from committing immorality. Because we all know it is the Lord's will that a person live a holy life. Therefore, we say, Lord, in Jesus' name, help him to stop immorality. Because why? We know that that is the will of God, that he lives a holy life. So when it comes to healing, if our belief and our faith is that God wants to heal the sick, 
then you don't pray, oh God, if it's your will, heal him. No, we pray the same way we confront a sin of immorality because we believe in the same power of the cross. That the power of the cross breaks the power of immorality. The power of the cross is the same power that heals the sick. We simply take authority over the sickness in the name of Jesus and appropriate the healing power of the cross. This does not mean that every, in every case of healing, we will see instantaneous healing. Because often we have to do spiritual warfare just like we do spiritual warfare. We battle against the sin that seeks to destroy us. But we do it confidently. We ask with confidence because we know that the cross of Jesus Christ has defeated the power of sin and also the power of sicknesses. So yes, the Old Testament evidence shows us that healing is based on the name of God the very character, the very nature of God, healing is not only part of the Mosaic Covenant, it is even part of the New Covenant. And in the New Testament, there are also evidence to show us that it is God's will that we be healed. Let's look at the New Testament evidence. The Old Testament alone already can give us sufficient evidence and confidence in releasing healing and believing God for healing. But this truth is further confirmed in the New Testament. Firstly, in the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. Consider the life of Jesus of the 3,774 verses in the four Gospels. Okay, I didn't count them. Huh? This is based on research. Somebody counted it. Okay, 3,774 verses in the four Gospels, 484 verses relate specifically to the healing of physical and mental illness and even the raising of the dead. So it is very clear that a large part of the ministry of Jesus was tackling the problem of sicknesses. In fact, if we don't count the verses, we count the stories, okay, the narratives. If we count the narratives, there are 1,257 narrative verses in the four Gospels, 484. This means it's about 38.5%, almost 40% of all the narratives is about healing. This means that Jesus spent 40% of his time Praying for the sick. So healing is a big part of the ministry of Jesus. This is the first reason in the New Testament that we see that when Jesus came, a big part of His work was healing the sick. The second evidence in the New Testament is this, the healing ministry of the apostles and the disciples. Some people may say, hey, you know, when it comes to healing the sick, it's only Jesus Christ who does it when He was on earth. That is not the norm. That is not the norm for Christians. I want to challenge that. Let's study the healing ministry of the apostles and the rest of the disciples in the New Testament. And understand that it's not just Jesus who healed the sick. It's the fact that the disciples, the apostles, the church heals the sick. Healing is a significant part of the ministry of the church because the Great Commission included the ministry of healing. Luke chapter 9 verse 1 to 2 tells us when Jesus had called the twelve together, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Notice that the preaching of the kingdom of God and healing the sick goes hand in hand together. You cannot talk about the kingdom of God, you cannot talk about the gospel and you exclude healing. Because Jesus made it very clear that these two must go together. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus gave the same commission and authority to the 72 when He sent them out. Luke chapter 10 verse 1 says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of Him to every town and place where He was about to go. So Jesus was sending people out and in verse 8 to 9, it shows us what were they told to do, what were they instructed to do. Luke 10, verse 8 to 9 says, When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. All of us will say, Amen, let's eat. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Now, in our four tabus, we have no problem with the wallop. We eat the food after everything. Can I challenge you that one of the things that must happen in your meetings is that you heal the sick. And when you heal the sick, after that, what do you tell them? The kingdom of God is near you. Church, please understand that when we preach the gospel, it's not just a gospel of salvation. And when sal it is true, it's a gospel of salvation. But when, when it comes to salvation, salvation doesn't mean prepare for heaven. Salvation is total. 
that God saves us from our sicknesses and our diseases as well. Jesus was training the disciples to carry out the work after He was gone. And when He sent out every one of them, His 12, His 70, you know, two by two, the same message consistently is that when you preach the message of the kingdom of God, healing of the sick must go together. It's, it is seen very clearly in the Great Commission. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 18 tells us, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. So it's very clear that when we go out and preach the gospel, these signs will follow those who believe. These signs will follow those who come in my name. What are some of these things that are supposed to happen? Hey, casting out demons is, is common stuff, you know. Healing the sick, laying hands on the sick is supposed to be normal. It's not just telling people that you will be saved, you're going to heaven, your name is going to be written in the book of life. We need to see the reality of God. And think with me on this, you know, when Jesus said in Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, we have no problem baptizing people, right? Well, I say, you must be baptized. Well, you, must be, you must be baptized. But the Bible says, teach them to obey everything I have instructed you. What are the other things that Jesus has instructed His disciples? These are found in the earlier verses we have read in Luke, chapter 9 and chapter 10. And what are some of these things that Jesus has instructed is, go and pray for the sick. When you preach the kingdom of God, when there's sick people, lay hands on them and pray for them. Do you not think that this authority included the authority to heal the sick today? When we teach them to observe all things, does it not include teaching the disciples to carry out the ministry of supernatural healing? I tell you the answer is, of course it does. In fact, this was how the apostles and disciples understood. For them, it was very clear. They understood the message. When Jesus said, teach them to obey everything, everything included, preach the gospel and pray for the sick. So this is the reason why healing ministry was a prominent ministry in the New Testament church. In the book of Acts, we read in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John healed the lame at the temple gate. And as a result of that one miracle of healing, what happened? Many people came to know the Lord. Many were brought to church. And as you, as you read the rest of the book of Acts, even the shadow of Peter, when he falls on the sick, they will get healed. In Acts chapter 5, verse 15 to 16, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, the reason why Peter and John and the early disciples, they were always involved in the healing ministry, not just the preaching of the gospel, was because they understood. They understood it is together. It's not because the weather was hot, you know, they need some shade. So they put the sick people along the street so that Peter's shadow can give them one second of comfort. No, it's not for that purpose. It's for the reason that the gospel included the power of healing. Paul's handkerchief and apron were so anointed that even just touching them brought about healing. Acts chapter 19 verses 11 to 12. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. I want to tell you that the New Testament show us that the power of God was present for the healing of the sick because the church believed and the church practiced the ministry of healing. 
That's the second reason. The first reason, in the, the first evidence in the New Testament is the healing ministry of Jesus. The second evidence in the New Testament is the healing ministry of the apostles and the disciples. And now I want to go to the third evidence in the New Testament to show us that it is God's will that we be healed. It is the healing ministry taught in the epistles, you know. So people may say that the healing ministry of Jesus and the disciples in the early church confirms that God wants to heal and God wants to bring physical healings to the people. But they say that this is only because it is just a narrative. The book of Acts is just a narrative, just a, a story, just to tell us stories. It is not supposed to happen today. Those are 2,000 years ago. It is just to record history. I want to challenge this because, you know, the gospel and the book of Acts is not just telling us what happened. They contain lessons for us to follow. In the book of Acts and in the gospel, there are lessons, there are examples for us to follow, to obey, to learn from. And therefore, we know that the book of Acts is still being written by us today. Today, all of us are agents of miracles that we still need to see the acts of the Holy Spirit through all of us. And when we come to the teaching portion of the New Testament, which is the epistles, the letters of Paul and, and other apostles, we, we see clear instruction to the church, not just to the disciples, not just to the apostles, it's not just the ministry of Jesus Christ, but it is the teaching to the church that we must all be involved in a ministry of healing. In fact, read carefully 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us the gifts of healing have been given to the church. Let's look at verse 9. It says, To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And this is the posture, this is the position that the Lord wants, is that every church is complete, that this gift of healing is given by the same Spirit. And to what extent? To the extent that there was no lack of spiritual gift among the church. And the, and the verse I want to quote is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. Paul said this, For in Him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. I believe we are in the same position as the church in Corinth 2,000 over years ago. They were waiting for Jesus Christ to come back and the verse says what? That as you eagerly wait for Jesus Christ to be revealed, you do not lack any spiritual gift. I believe that therefore today, we do not have any lack. It is a matter of whether we know that this is the promises of God, we stand on the promises of God and we believe it. And when you believe it, you will see more of the healing ministry in our midst. In fact, it is further seen in the book of James that the healing ministry must continue in the church today. James chapter 5, verse 14 to 15 says, Is anyone among you ill? That let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So the Bible says very clearly, hey, if there's anybody who is sick in the church, go and see a doctor. No. Okay, yes, in, in see doctor, Dr. Jesus. Bring him, to the, bring him to the elders. Let the elders lay hands on them, anoint them with oil. Or some of us, I know when I quoted this passage last night, you know, one of the staff came and told me, hey, you know, he's talking about just the elders. What about the rest of the church? I, I, I included the next verse. In James chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So there you go, in the church, if there's anybody who is sick, you know, method one is you look for an elder. The method two is you confess your sins to one another, you pray for each other. And therefore, we must understand that the will of God for the church today is that when there is sickness in our midst, let's pray for each other. And that's what we're going to do later. So we see that it's God's will to heal in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. And therefore, we can ask with confidence when it comes to healing ministry. So the first biblical principle concerning the ministry of healing 
And the implication for us is, number one, God's will is that we be healed. Therefore, we must ask for healing for ourselves or for other people. We must ask with confidence. Now, the second biblical principle concerning the ministry of healing is that Christians are ministers of healing. And we must go with compassion. You know, God wants to heal. God wants people to be healed. But the people who are supposed to minister the healing are who? Are the Christians. We must go out. We must be the agents to bring about healing for the people who are sick, who are suffering. This is the second thing that the Bible teaches about when it comes to the ministry of healing. It teaches us that Christians are to minister healing to the sick. It is not the job of angels. It is not something for the spiritual or the pastors or only leaders. But every Christian is a minister of healing. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a minister of healing. Now, this is more than just praying for the sick and hope for the best. Huh? You know, I know some people, when they come to pray for the sick, they just, ah, oh, yeah. Pray for you, uh, and then uh, hope for the best. Uh. If, you, if, you, if you get well, hang. Uh. You know, if you don't get well, uh, okay, uh, sorry. No, no, no. You pray with confidence. You really, really believe that it is going to happen because it is the same way we believe that their sins will be forgiven. So when we pray for the sick, you must, you must be confident of the power of the cross. You must be confident of the Word of God. You must be confident that God's power is going to be released by the Holy Spirit through you. Not through me, not through Pastor Kong. We can't be everywhere. All of us are ministers of healing. Healing is God's will. It is His nature. It is in His name. It is in the old covenant. It is in the new covenant. It is part of the Great Commission. All of us are part of the Great Commission. Amen? Amen? So He says, these signs will follow the pastors. In my name, the pastors will heal the sick. No, He says, everyone who believe. Are you a believer? Yes. No, very soft. Uh. I need to preach harder. It's time we put our faith in the Word of God, not in our experience. If you put your faith in the Word of God, the experience will come. If you put your faith in your experience and your experience is a lousy one and you stop believing, of course the miracles will not come. So we must understand that it is time for us to stand on the Word of God. That healing is His will. We are the agents. So you can be used by God. You must believe that. I've explained earlier how Jesus wanted all His teachings to be taught to His disciples as they preached the gospel to the ends of the earth. So that healing and miracles are performed by every disciple. Because that was what Jesus sent them out to do. In fact, one of the disciples picked it up. He picked up. He picked up what Jesus taught because he was taught by others about what Jesus taught him. This was the famous Apostle Paul. How he preached the gospel was by performing miracles. That was how the gospel is supposed to be preached. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5 says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So Paul understood that the teaching that he received from the other disciples of the early church, because he was converted later, was that, hey, you know, Paul was not exactly an eloquent man. He's not exactly a wise person. In fact, I think it gives us a lot of encouragement that when he came to the people in Corinth, he came with fear, he came with trembling. And that's what many of us are, right? When we preach the gospel, sometimes we have fear, sometimes we are trembling, sometimes we say things, hey, I'm not eloquent, I don't know enough, I don't know how to answer questions. There is a lot of fear and anxieties. Congratulations, um, there is a shadow of Apostle Paul in you. And I want to congratulate you further that what did he do? He says, I want to preach one thing. All of us have no problem with that. We always say, oh, no, Paul only preached one thing, Christ crucified, Christ crucified. Correct. I agree, amen. But you know, when you preach Christ crucified, what's going to happen after that? 
is found in the subsequent verses in 6 and 7. It says what? Demonstration of power. So as much as you preach about the cross of Jesus Christ, hey, when you do that, when Paul did that, he said this, with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. Paul not only demonstrated power, the reason why he did that, he was fearful, he was trembling, he was maybe insecure, but his love and his compassion for the Corinthian Christians caused him to preach despite all his insecurities. And that's what we all must do because it's also the example of Christ that if we know that it is God's will that all of us, we can be healed, then when we go out, we must we must go with a lot of compassion. We must go beyond our fear. We must not yield to our insecurities. We must go out with compassion. Because Paul did that, and not only did Paul do that, Jesus went with compassion as well when he prayed for the sick. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14 says, When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. The reason why Jesus healed the sick it is a fulfillment of the Old Testament Psalm 103 that we just read. Forget not all His benefit. For He forgive our sin and He has compassion on us. It is the compassion of God. The same God has not changed. He is the same God in the Old Testament, the same God in the New Testament. He is the same God today. He still has compassion. So when we pray for the sick, we must have compassion. Today, I want to pray that all of us will have a compassion that will drive us to look for sick people and empathize with them and say, I want to bring you a message of hope. The Lord can heal you. So much so that our compassion is greater than our fears, than our trembling, so that we become like Apostle Paul who will go out and preach the gospel. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 36. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, these are very powerful verses that tell us, hey, Jesus had compassion. When we go out, do we have compassion? Recently, I came back from Paris last week. Last Saturday, I came back from Paris after ministering there for one week. I remember something that happened 20 years ago. You know, I speak French because I learned French. I was sent to France for attachment and that's how I picked up the language. And it was in France I encountered God, okay? I didn't, I didn't have a church to go to, but it was there that I spent a lot of time with God. I began reading the Bible every day. I began worshipping God every day for four hours because in summertime when I was there, the sun doesn't set until 10 p.m. So I remember that, you know, I finished my language classes at 5 p.m. I had my dinner at 6 o'clock, finished. And then from 6 to 10 o'clock, I got nothing to do. You know, I started to walk, uh, you know, in the big field, in circles with my walkman. And I began to talk to God. It was there that, you know, my goosebump phenomenon started to happen. And I began to hear God very clearly. I remember there was one thing the Lord challenged me. You know, one, one, one day I was praying and the Lord said to me that, Wilong, you, you, don't have, you don't have love for people. You don't have compassion for people. And it's true, you know, uh, that time I was very happy that I was a Christian, I was saved, you know, but whether other people come to know the Lord, I, you know, it doesn't bother me. Anyway, I'm going to heaven, bye, you know. Uh, it, it really wasn't something that bothered me. I know about the Great Commission, I know it's important, I know heaven and hell are real, but I had no feelings for people. So I remember that, that time, God challenged me, you know, every day, ask me for compassion, ask me for love for people. I remember from that, from that time, you know, somewhere in, either from July to October, I started one year, every day, every day lunchtime, I prayed to God, God, give me more love, give me compassion for people because I don't feel a thing for people. So I remember after one year, uh, it was uh, one year later, the Lord said, not enough, pray for one more year. So I prayed for a total of two years. Two years for compassion, two years for love for people. And it was in 1996, you know, 1995, uh, 97, sorry. 96 was the year I went to France, 97, 98. So in two years when I prayed for compassion, that is the, right, that, that is the reason why suddenly, suddenly, you know, I have a burden. It was supernatural because why? I felt the compassion that when I see sickness, I, I look at verses like this, I say, hey, something is not right, you know. When we look at people who are lost. We have compassion for their eternity. 
but we don't have compassion when they are struggling in their sickness. And I said to God, God, that must change. And supernaturally, you know, I begin to cry out, even though I have not seen yet, even though I have not seen yet, the first miracle of healing that I saw, a significant one, uh, okay, I don't talk about the small things like headache, you know, all this. I mean, all these are great, uh, thank God for them, we should see more of them. You know, but the big one that I saw was for my son, okay, some of you will have heard the testimony before. You know, my son has a cyst in his neck. Sometimes when I pray for healing, I pray for a total of seven months, nothing happened. But I believe that God can heal because it's God's will, it, it is in the Bible. But nothing happened, but I did not give up, even though I do not see it. And I remember after seven months of praying, one day in Expo, we were worshipping God in Expo, and Pastor Kong was preaching on stage, and he said there's a, there a child here with neck problem, God wants to heal him. And that, that service, I, was, I wasn't a pastor yet, I was just a leader in church, you know. Everybody looked at me, our cell members looked at me, I brought my son forward. That day, they prayed for my son, someone prayed for my son, his neck straightened up, the cyst is still there in his neck. This, he was two and a half years old then. Today, he's 13 years old. His neck is straightened up. There's no more pain. The cyst is still there. But there's no impact at all. God took away the pain. His neck was initially like this. You know, and every time we cross a bump, he, he would cry. You know, he, would, he would scream in pain. But ever since that Sunday service, you know, we threw away the collar. God healed him. Now, I cannot explain why. It took seven months of prayer. I cannot explain. I cannot explain why some people are healed instantaneously. But I know that God heals. And I know that in order to see healing more and more, we must be moved by the condition of the people. Today, we need to be driven by the same compassion to see the suffering of the sick and ask God confidently for healing the sick. Today, maybe some of us are like Apostle Paul. We have great fear, we have great trembling that we may not know enough, we may not be eloquent. Paul felt that way too. But he went out with compassion. He went out and he did not let that trembling stop him. Every time you overcome your fear and you apply the Word of God, something grows inside you. This is what it means when we say that it is a discipline, when we exercise the muscle in us, you know. Nothing appears to be happening, right? When you exercise, carry dumbbells. Do you see that your muscles suddenly become bigger and bigger as you, as, you, as, you, as you lift the dumbbell? No, right? Nothing seems to be happening. In fact, after doing 100 repetitions, what happened? Oh, the next day, huh? oh, my arm is so painful. But something was happening inside. Even though on the outside, you don't see anything. The muscles are, are tearing, you know, they are forming, they are becoming stronger. The next time you do 100, you realize something. Eh, not so, not so heavy anymore. Now I can do 200. Even though on the outside, nothing appears to be happening, on the inside, something is happening. This is the same way that when we exercise spiritual gift, even though on the outside, nothing happens. For seven months, nothing happens. But we keep believing, we keep speaking the healing, suddenly, it appears. Because why? On the inside, in the spirit realm, something is happening. Our confidence comes from the knowledge of God's Word. God's Word tells us that He wants to heal. It is His nature. And therefore, we stand on the promise of God. We step out like Apostle Paul because there are needs out there. And God wants to heal the sick. His method is through us. Do we recognize we are the minister of healing? Are you willing to go out? We read Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36 that Jesus had compassion when He saw the people. Wow, you know, He had compassion. He began to heal them because they are like sheep without shepherd. In verses 37 to 38, He said this, when Jesus saw all that, He said to all His disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest field. When Jesus saw the great need of the people, when Jesus had compassion and said, these are poor people, they are harassed, they are helpless. And what was His answer? His answer was to His disciples, hey, look, look at the needs out there. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Do you know what's the problem with the church today? The problem with the church today is that we are happy to see the lost as they are, but nobody wants to be their worker. Nobody wants to go out and say, I want to bring you to somebody called Jesus Christ who can heal the sick. We don't want to work hard. 
We don't want to exercise our spiritual gift. We don't want to overcome our fear. We don't want to overcome our trembling. I believe the Holy Spirit will come in power when we believe beyond the shadow of doubt. God wants to heal and we are to move together with Him. Let us not change our theology or our interpretation of the Bible to justify what we do not see. We often like to challenge the Word of God with our circumstances. Today, I want to say to all of us, we must challenge our circumstances with the Word of God. That when I don't see healing, I say, this is not right. This is not right. This is not acceptable. Can I have the musician out? I believe that God wants us to hear this message because the Holy Spirit wants us to bring, wants to bring us to a higher plane in bringing healing and to see God's supernatural work of healing. Now, when I talk about spiritual gift, it is like a muscle, you know. The more you exercise, the more you do it, the more you use it, it's a discipline, you fan it into flame. When it comes to casting out demons, you know, I remember when I first started, you know, the first case took two hours. Oh, two hours shouting, a lot of words. You know, I read passages like this, Jesus said one word and the demons left. I said, wow, two hours, you know, I don't know said how many thousand words. So I said, cannot be, right? One case take two hours. So my second time, I cast out demon 30 minutes. I said, hey, not bad, you know, 75% improvement. And the third time, it was 10 minutes. And nowadays, generally, generally, okay, it takes less than 30 minutes. But recently, a few days ago, I encountered a difficult case. Two days consecutive, four hours each, cannot get the demons out. What? I went and said, hey, God, what happened, you know? Eh, never encountered this for a long time, difficult cases. I said, wow, what happened? Huh? Four hours, on, I mean, I was in the midst of preparing, preparing for the message. Wow, then I realized, it. wow, every day four hours were quite drained, okay? So I didn't understand. I didn't understand what was going on. And, you know, this family, the, the son is in, in our team, has been attending cell for one year. And suddenly, you know, he began to speak in a, a weird voice. Uh, he became totally strange. He speak weird. He began to talk to himself, you know, and when we went to minister to him, well, this demon is quite interesting. Uh, it has a gift of word of knowledge. That demon can know things. Uh, the few of us were there, he, he can point to different people and tell them things that this man, this young man wasn't supposed to know. Quite amazing one. Okay, I didn't want to say cute, lah, you know. In very, when I say, wow, this demon, uh, not bad, uh, got standard, uh, quite powerful. So we couldn't get it out and I didn't understand. Does it challenge my faith about casting out a demon? No. I know on Wednesday, couldn't get it out. Thursday, I went again, four hours again. Friday, I was preparing my message, I couldn't go. Saturday, Sunday, I couldn't go. Monday, I'm going to go again. Even if it takes another four hours, I'm going to cast out the demons. Monday, it doesn't come out. Tuesday, I'm going again. Wednesday, it doesn't come. Tuesday, it doesn't come out. Wednesday, I'm going again. Thursday, I'm going again. I'm going to keep going until the demon comes out. But a very interesting thing happened. After two days of not seeing the demons come out, initially the father said, what? The father of this young man is not a believer. The whole family are not believers. You know, so we went to the house, you know, we pray. You know, the father said, oh, this one is a stress-related, stress-related. You know, so he kept saying that. I know I didn't want to go and argue with him because, you know, don't, it's not with persuasive words, you know, it's by the demonstration. So I wanted him to see the power of God, but it didn't happen, you know. So after two days, Uncle also quite nice, never say any negative things, just that, oh, these are stress related. So I said, my uncle, you want to bring in see doctor, go ahead, but I don't believe you'll cure. It's the root, you know, you'll cure the problem. Uh, no, no offense to doctors, uh, you know. But this is a spiritual problem. So, very interesting, uncle brought him to see a TCM on Friday afternoon. And the amazing thing was this TCM person, you know, worship another, has another religion. And when he saw the son, he told the father this. Oh, this case, uh, this case uh, must look for the Most High God. And the Most High God, you have to look for the Christians. <laughs> last night, last night at 1 a.m., uh, not last night, uh, Saturday morning, 1 a.m., okay, before I preached last night, you know, my, my leader messaged me. The father called him at 1.30 a.m., say, hey, hello, can you tell your pastor? Can you tell Pastor, I went to the TCM this afternoon, Friday afternoon. You know, the TCM doctor says that we need to look for Christian. Can you tell our pastor that any day he wants to come back to pray for my son, we welcome him. And only one condition, must call on the name of the Most High God, Jesus Christ.
You see, sometimes we want to get the demons out immediately. But I tell you, maybe the father won't believe lah, because it's stress-related. But now, now the father has more faith than many Christians. He knows who is the most high God. I want to tell us that when we pray for healing, it is the same. I remember in Paris, you know, I went there to conduct life class, the pre-encounter and the encounter weekend for the people. So I preached from, from about 10 a.m. in the morning until 10 p.m. at night. Okay, everything was done by me except for one or two topics. So I remember we were there from Monday to Wednesday and Wednesday night, you know, my 12, uh, four of my 12 were with us, you know, plus my wife, we were there ministering and we finished the encounter weekend, you know, we see the great move of God. And on Thursday, I released my G12 leaders, you know, my 12 for their holidays. You know, I say, since you come to Paris on your own course, you know, you go and enjoy your holiday. We will do the G12 consultation on our own, myself and Pastor Christabel. So on the Wednesday night, it was the last night we were together, you know, and they, they hinted, lah, they hinted, wow, we come to Paris, uh, we must experience the alfresco. You know, uh, uh, you know, sit down at the cafe, drink coffee and all that. And, and it was 10 p.m. at night. After our session, actually I was very tired and I had to prepare for the next day's G12 consultation. I had to teach something. So actually I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go, but then, you know, the hin hin, then uh, the pastor who was hosting us, pastor who was very nice, he kind of knew that my 12 really wanted to, uh, you know, have go to the cafe and sit down there and, you know, kill car a little bit. So he brought us to the cafe and while we were sitting down there, you know, this is, uh, I think, an eye-opener about healing. You know, when we were sitting down there, we, we, we didn't have coffee like, because it was at night. We didn't want to sleep. So we had red wine instead. While we were drinking there, Suddenly, Pastor Hu said, you know, he, he started to tell me about his testimony about healing. And he began to say, hey, um, is someone here? There were only seven of us, you know, six of us and plus him seven. He said, is there someone here with some pain in the back? And one of my child said, hey, yeah, that's me, you know. And Pastor Hu said, oh, um, yeah, I think the Lord just, you know, impressed me that, uh, you know, there's some pain. And he said, can, can we pray for healing together? I tell you, we pray for 30 seconds. And what he prayed was very simple. It was like this. Uh, dear Jesus, thank you. Please take away the pain. Amen. I tell you, in 30 seconds, the pain disappeared. Today, my 12 is still healed because the pain had been with him for many months. So I began to realize that, hey, look, healing is that simple. No band, no worship team, no whatever. Just, you say it's a red wine. Hey, don't, no worries, don't be offended. Don't pangkang, okay? Not yet. But let us humble ourselves before God and really understand that why is it that we just believe, why is it that we just pray simple prayers and God can heal? It's because healing is the will of God. All of us are ministers of the healing. Today, we are going to demonstrate it. So I want all of us to stand to our feet, whether you're here in TC, or over there at Suntec City. This is what we're going to do. Okay, yesterday night, we, yesterday night we did exactly the same thing. Okay, we're going to pray for a first group of people. Okay, this is, uh, we are, we're going to pray for the rest later. Okay, but this is the first group I want to pray for first. Okay, uh, this is a group of people you have physical evidence right now of their sickness or their disease, meaning uh, that there is currently pain in your body or there is something you cannot do right now because of that pain or because of that disease. Maybe there is something physically you can see there's a lump, there's a growth here somewhere or you cannot bend or when you do something, it's going to cause you pain. You know, if you have that condition right now, okay, there is a physical evidence. That means that if you are healed, can prove one. You can, you can test it and say, oh yeah, yeah, now I can do this. It's no longer painful. Okay, I want this kind of cases. If you still experience that pain, if you still have that condition right now, this is the group I want to pray for first. Can you put up your hand, please? Wherever you are. Okay, up there in the balcony as well, in Suntec as well. Okay, all these people who put up your hand, I want you to come forward. Leave your seat and come forward. Leave your seat and come forward. Every single one, okay? Every single one, just come forward, okay? You have a pain in your body. There is some physical thing you cannot do, okay? That means that when you are healed, you can verify one, okay? That means you cannot reach up your hand like this. But after that, you know, when you are healed, you, you are able to test it, okay? I want all these people to come to the front. Even up there in the balcony, just come to the front. And even in Suntec, it's the same. Okay, I don't need the leaders to come out yet. 
I don't need the consolidators nor the pastors to come out yet. Okay, just let the people who are sick come out first. This is exactly the same thing we did last night. I want to tell you that healing is in the nature of God. It is part of the gospel. It is the power of the cross. As much as forgiveness of sin is part of the package. Our God is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. Keep coming. Okay, keep coming. Even at Suntech as well. I want all the people at the front just to close your eyes. And let us pray together to ask God to demonstrate His power to come and heal us. Dear Jesus, we thank you that Lord, your name is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. Lord, by your wounds, we are healed. And this morning, Lord, we ask that you release your healing upon your children. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come and heal your children, whatever is their pain, whatever is their infirmity, whatever is their diseases. Lord, we ask for your healing to come on them right now. Remove that pain. Thank you for your healing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. If you praise, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, those of you at the front here, <clears throat> just now you had some pain, right? Or there's something you couldn't do. I want you to test right now whether the pain is still there or if you couldn't do certain things, now you try and do those things. Can you do that right now? Those of you who came to the front, whether you are over there at Suntech or over here at TC. Okay? Whatever you couldn't do just now, you came up with pain, you know, there's pain. If the pain has left you, or if you couldn't do something just now, okay, now you could do it, or the pain has left you, can you put up your hand? Okay, come. Uh, I want these people to come on stage. Okay, Suntech as well, you prepare, come. Those who put up your hand, come up. Okay, please queue here. Okay, uh, come. Melvin, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, tell, what is your name? Um, Vivian. Vivian, okay, what happened to you? Um, I couldn't... Just some weeks ago, when I squatted, then there was this tiak sound, and I couldn't, I couldn't squat. But I now I can. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now no pain. Wow, praise God. The Lord heal you completely. Amen. As of yesterday, she couldn't squat. Okay, Melvin, come. Uh, Pastor, I, uh, myself knows I tore my uh, ligament in my left wrist. Uh, it's been going on for about three months. I cannot bend this way, and I cannot bend this way, but now I'm... And the pain that was in this spot is completely gone now. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, let's go over to Suntech. Let's have Pastor Charmaine to help us. What's your name? Uh, my name is Lynn. Yes, I just be here to think. Uh, actually, my down here is very painful. I feel like this a long there. But now it's gone. And I was, when Pastor Willan was telling something uh, about healing, and then I heard something very, very loud. Usually, this, my ear, this one is not really clear when I hear something, but this something is like holding me and just suddenly it's so loud. I keep testing my ear and holding the other ear to cover, and I said, it's still very loud. And said, I said, thank you, Lord Jesus. I'll be healed. I'll be healed. Amen. 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 Right. Come. What's your name? Can you share about your healing? My name is Nerisa. I'm, I've just felt that uh, the Lord uh, completely healed me from my shoulder. Uh, my shoulder was, uh, cannot move. In, I, if I move, I'm, it's very pain. Now I can move properly and then thanks to the Lord for the complete healing. 
Praise God. Praise God. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I'm Kenneth, and um, this morning uh, when I woke up, I find that I cannot bend. I have a lower back pain on my on my left. And uh, when Pastor Wei Long just prayed for I think that 30 seconds, and I tried, the pain just left. Praise the Lord. Can you try now? Try now. Stop. Try now. Try now. Try now. Try now. Must bend all the way. Try now. Try now. Bend. 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 Can you try now? Yeah. Try. Yeah. All the way. Woo! Yeah. Go. Praise God. Amen. Come on, let's give praise to God. I have a confession to make. I have never done this before. Yesterday night was my first time doing something like this. I didn't know whether something would happen or not. I just went by faith last night. And the same thing happened. Someone was in pain for 10 years. He was healed. Couldn't bend down, bend down completely and say there's no pain. I want to challenge all of us. Okay, it is like this. And we're going to do the next thing. So for all these people who are at the front, now, What's going to happen is that we're going to get people to lay hands on you and to pray for you. Because sometimes, what happens about faith is this. You know, when you don't receive healing, but you hear of testimony, then suddenly, faith begins to rise up within you. Because say, hey, actually, can, uh, can happen to me also. Uh, I will believe. And also, we are applying another portion of Scripture that says that the prayers offered in faith will make the sick person well. So now, we're going to invite the leaders, the consolidators, the pastors to come forward to begin to lay hands on the people at the front and make sure that everybody is prayed for. You may use the anointing oil to anoint them with oil to pray for them. And at this point, if there are people, you know, down there, it doesn't matter whether your pain can be verified or not. You know, if you have a sickness in your body, you can also leave your seat to come to the front. We're going to pray for you as well. And after that, you can go and get your medical report and see whether you're healed or not. Okay? Those, you, you can do it later, but we want to pray for you. Okay? So I want the, the leaders, I want the pastors, I want, you know, people who want to say, hey, I'm going to pray for the sick. You know, you leave your seat, brother to brother, sister to sister, lay your hands on the people at the front and pray for them. Okay? And we can worship the Lord quietly in the background as we continue to believe that the power of God is going to come and heal the sick. Let's worship the Lord and let's pray for the sick. We need more leaders to come out, please. someone lay hands and pray for you how many of you right now test your condition okay test your condition how many of you have been healed after the second prayer put up your hand okay look around come on put up your hand okay there are more hands right now in Suntech as well so I want you to understand that praying for the sick is not something you know mysterious something that you know, I, the reason why I don't want, you know, Pastor Hu also shared with me, nowadays when he pray for the sick, he doesn't want to touch them. Because when he touch them, sometimes people get the impression it's the pastor's hands that bring about healing. But healing is in the nature, it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Healing comes from the promises and the Word of God. And all of us are ministers of that healing. Some of you are going to go back home and you're going to realize that the healing took place on your way home. The healing took place when you reach home. Because last night, there were people messaging me, sending me message. Yeah, I went home and then suddenly that pain stopped. I tell you, it's going to happen, alright? So church, would, I, would, you, would, would all of us just raise up our hands and receive a new impartation of faith? Father, we thank you. That Lord, your word is clear that the power of the cross is not just for the forgiveness of sin. It's not just for the redemption and the atonement from the power of sin. But Lord, it is to bring healing to our bodies. And Father, we thank You. It is Your will that we be healed 
it is also your will that we are ministers of the healing so lord use every single one of us lord i impart faith into them i impart your anointing upon them that today this week as they go back lord they desire earnestly spiritual gift even the gift of prophecy even the ministry of healing that when they hear of someone who is sick lord they will pray for the sick they will preach the good news they will heal the sick and this sign shall follow them that they will cast out demons and they will lay hands on the sick and they will get well and they can tell the people the kingdom of God is near you and many are going to come and know the demonstration of the power of God and they will give their life to Jesus because this is church this is your church and we are your church so use us we thank you in Jesus name Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Go and pray for the sick. Amen.